Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Things and problems that you should be looking for in your garden right now. As well as five garden tips that will help your garden out. And we have Pam from brownthumbmama.com. She's a blogger and author and a great advocate for natural living. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. Garden Radio is on the air and it all starts right now. You are tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee. With your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city. And Holly Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience. Who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners. Founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, or anywhere in between, we are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening, now containing over 925 garden videos, in-studio videos, podcasts, and a whole lot more. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is where you can find all of that. And we are here every Saturday morning because of great companies you'll hear throughout the program. And Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at nasala.com. If you don't want coffee, grab a Nasala Kabucha for a breakfast meal. You can contact us in a number of ways on the program here. If you want to contact us during the program, you can call in the ivyorganics.com hotline. You can call in to 414-444-5250. Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Garden actually protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees. Ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivorganics.com. Again, that's 444-5250. And you can tweet us at any time at hashtag TWVG. You can take a photograph of your garden, your problem. You can tweet us with that. You can also email us those photographs at uh, TWVGradio at gmail.com. Well, there's a number of great benefits of being in the garden, and courtesy of Central Texas Gardener, which is a PBS gardening program out of the Austin, Texas area. We are good friends with the producer, Linda, down there. Uh, They were able to pass along a transcript of a little bit of their segment indicating how healthy getting your hands in the soil really is. It's called the farm effect. Gardening is healthy for you. Most of you Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener fans already know that the amazing healing energy that can be found when your hands are in dirt, digging in the dirt, is good for you, and it's good for children also. <clears throat> Microbes in garden dirt can help boost your immune system and make you healthier and happier. Unfortunately, we have become a nation of germaphobes, using hand sanitizers and wipes and strong chemicals for disinfecting our homes. In the past 20 years, there has been a dramatic increase in asthma and allergy rates. We see pharmacies popping up at every corner as a result. One in 12 children has asthma, even more have allergies. When we change from an agrarian society in the late 20th century, allergies have become more prevalent in the upper class in the U.S. and Britain. Farmers and their families were least likely to suffer from allergy issues. A recent study of an Amish community in the U.S. found that they had the lowest rate of allergies in developed nations. The study found that these Amish families, including pregnant women and children, worked and played among farm animals and in barns where they were really ex- regularly exposed to a variety of microbes. Women exposed to microbes while pregnant have found to have children with the lowest rates of allergies. This initial exposure causes the children less reaction to pollen and dander, a sort of var- vaccination effect which was named the farm effect. The problem is not that the pollen is out there, it's that we react to the pollen and early exposure to allergens allows children's immune systems to adapt to their environment. A common soil mycobacterium was found to have a natural antidepressant effect on the brain, and it can actually have the same effect that the drug Prozac has on the brain without all the side effects. 
working in the soil can help stimulate serotonin production, which leads to feeling more relaxed and happy. When we harvest food, the brain produces more dopamine. There's actually a harvest high that is probably linked to our primitive brain when hunting and gathering successfully was crucial to survival. Having your hands in the soil can lower your blood pressure and stress hormones and improve memory. Inflammatory skin conditions like psoriasis and gut conditions like Crohn's disease and even arthritis can be improved by experiencing soil microbes. Gardeners get lots of vitamin D from being outside and also increase their good hormone serotonin, which helps regulate melatonin levels, which leads to good sleep. Children who play outside regularly tend to have more adventurous, confident, and self-motivated to use their imaginations and more. So get the kids involved in gardening as early as possible. Provide them with a window box or container gardens if you don't have a garden space. You might even notice they will eat wild, wider variety of fruits and vegetables when they have the experience of growing and harvesting food. And let kids get dirty. Splashing in puddles and making mud pies is not only fun for kids, it's actually good for them. And if you're feeling blue, a little garden green might be your best cure. Courtesy of Central Texas Gardening PBS program. We thank Linda for that. And it goes uh, without needing any explanation for that so let's get into what we need to look for in our garden here uh, during the summer months because there's a certain uh, level of gardener who plants their produce puts seeds in the grounds and they think that's all they need to do and they may just be uneducated and there's certain procedures in which we need to practice and follow and or maybe for. that's all they want to do then maybe that's all they want to do With any activity in life, there is a maintenance requirement in order to have an end result that is successful and rewarding, whether you're putting a car together or a model plane or gardening, you have to take steps and you just can't do step one and expect step 12 to be successful when you don't do the steps in between. So powdery mildew. Which is not yet relevant in the garden, at least not yet, but it's something that we're all going to get on our cucumbers or melons or pumpkins or squash. Right. Um, well, hopefully not, but it, it is possible, especially with all this rain we've been having, which is not a bad thing, but it could it could be problematic. So it's it basically looks like white powdery patches on the leaves of the plants, and basically the the plant's eventually would become suffocated by this disease. The reason for it is because of not enough cool night temperatures, the air is a little bit too humid, and then you combine the rain with that, and then the plants being maybe too close together is what makes it a problem. That that powder, that mildew begins to form in the cool night temperatures with that moisture that still resonates on the leaves, and then that prevents the plant from absorbing the sunlight and begins to suffocate it or choke it out. If you get the early stages of it, and you can look on this on any of your search engines, you can eliminate, you can cut off those plant leaves that have that on it on the early stages and slow it down that way. What are some other remedies that you can... So one thing you can do is you can you can do an online search for some remedies, but what we found effective... Which slowed it down. It didn't get rid of it, but it slowed it down. Some people say, oh, I've had it, and it never bothered my plants at all. Now, whether that is true or not, I, I was not in their garden. But what you can't... But what slowed it down was a, a, it was a solution of uh, milk and water that we sprayed on the tops of the leaves and underside of the leaves, and it did, it did slow it down. There are chemical applications in which you can apply to your plants to help eat or dissolve that mildew, but if you just go online and... Search powdery mildew residue or uh, remedies, home remedies. Uh, Joe Lampo, he was a guest from uh, on the program here a couple of weeks ago, host of PBS's Growing a Green World. He's got a great article of all these home practices in which you can do in order to prevent. And even there's some preempted measures in which you can take before you actually get the powdery mildew, so you don't have to. You can be proactive instead of reactive. So powdery mildew is something you're going to get on your viney crops. Uh, without any, you know, it's going to happen. We've had it a number of years consecutively. If you know what you're doing, you can prolong that life of your plant. Bad bugs and other unfriendly uh, creatures in your garden. So one simple solution that you can do to get rid of bad bugs is to increase the good bugs. And we did a video on this a couple of weeks ago where we showed basically uh, it's like a kind of like a bug bath almost where you're attracting the good bugs to your garden by giving them a place to sit and drink water. And that will help a lot of times get rid of the bad bugs. But then there's also things like if you have the tomato hornworm problem, you can put bird seed 
um, in little containers around your tomatoes that will attract the birds who are going to get the hornworms. So it's kind of like working within your ecosystem using the good, the good, uh, friendly animals and bugs against the bad ones. And you just need to be vigilant. There are some times when you have to take excessive means in order to control the bad bugs in your garden. We put a video out yesterday. It's on the Instagram page. Uh, you can find all of that on the website. That is a garden tip. We usually do a 60-second garden tip on Friday, and it's about maybe not weeding as much. We found some lamb's quarters, which is an edible plant, an edible weed. It's a weed for most people. Native Americans use this as a uh, an edible plant. You can make pesto out of it. We found several of them in a walk path in which we had not covered yet. One was completely decimated by black aphids, and the other ones were fine. The plants around that we were growing, the peppers, the eggplant, or the peppers, the tomatoes, and the yacons, were not affected at all because these bad insects attacked the weeds and not our plants that we were growing. So you can find that on the web, uh, on on the Instagram page or on the Facebook page. But something maybe maybe those of you who don't want to weed as much, this is an encouragement for you to leave some of those weeds in the garden. We find that with thistles as well that these Aphids will attach themselves to the thistles and suck the juice out of it. An aphid is a bug like a tick on a human or animal. It sucks the blood or the juices out of the plant. Uh, doesn't, And eventually enough of them will attach them where it kills the plant. Right. So then another problem is a sign that you might be having problems. The plants will turn a different color. One classic sign of this is when the plant starts to yellow. That is often a nitrogen deficiency. Nitrogen is... Part of the part of what makes your plants green, and so that could be from too much watering, too much rain. If you're getting too much rain, that's not something you can necessarily control, but you can look to your garden and see if there's a reason why. Maybe in one particular area, like a couple of years ago, where we had some peppers, was a low area in our garden which constantly got puddled, and now we've taken initiatives to bring that up up a bit. As well as if your soil is too densely packed, let's say you have a very clay area that holds that moisture extremely, you know, a lot and causes the water to pool there, as well as the soil is not aerated enough and the water can't get through or the plants can't pick up the nutrients maybe that it's needing or you have poor soil where it's lacking that nutrients that it needs. So another another thing is early blight which we've talked about several times, but one thing to always combat early combat early blight would be to mulch. Mulching is good for around all of your plants. Really, it's going to help. Um, it's going to help reduce weeds. It's going to help keep reduce watering if you do need to water, and it's good for preventing things that are in your soil to splash up onto your plants. If you have a discoloring in your tomatoes, it's usually the lower leaves that it begins with. It's yellow with black spots. You can search this to, to confirm the problem that you have, but it's 99% early blight. Remove those bad leaves and throw them in the trash as well as continue to clean the bottom six to eight inches ground level to uh, up the plant. Make sure it's just bare stalk to prevent that any leaves from touching the ground, uh, and that will reduce your problems. And if you do have an outbreak, you can remove up to 25% of the actual foliage on the plant. Any more than that, you're going to really stress the plant out, but you want to remove all that infested uh, to- uh, leaves And be careful when you touch other plants because you can carry those spores on your gloves, on your hands, on your tools to uninfected plants. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, Proper watering is important to to get your plants. We talked a little bit about that. uh, On that, Uh, other things you want to be aware of are... uh, Corn smut, which is if you plant corn in the same area multiple years in a row, it's a it's actually a, a Hispanic uh, cuisine. It's a, right. a specialty down there uh, in in South America and Mexico, but it's not a pleasant thing to look at. But that's because you're having over nitrogen, too much nitrogen in the soil, which is messing up the uh, development of the ear of corn. Uh, bean rust, bean that's, rust. that's bean a rust. common one. And some of these are going to be airborne. So some of them cannot be easily prevented either. Uh, There's black spots on roses, and that's just some of the things you need to look for. And if you have a problem, you please do not hesitate to email us with a photograph so we can identify it. And if we can't identify it, we can send it to people who are able to identify it, and we'll get you a solution to your situation. Well, when we come back, it's five garden tips that you need to be doing right now in your July garden right after this. Joey and Holly use hashtag TWVG. 
the River West Co-op Grocery and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu, from apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe's delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. PlantSuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccess.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at MIGardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to MIGardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools, and special blend fertilizer. MIGardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Halle Berry. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. So happy you have joined us on this beautiful Saturday morning in Milwaukee. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com is your destination for all things gardening. 925 plus videos, digital magazines, podcasts, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and a whole lot more. Well, it is that time, Holly, where we have peaches getting drove to Milwaukee. Yeah, if you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company. You can find out where to pick up the top quality produce at tree-ripe.com. Right now is the time for peaches. They have peaches ready. And we got an email from them yesterday. Good um, news. Good it's news. good news. Yeah, they had they had thought they had a shortage because of the cold spring that we that was down in the south. But now they found a variety that is just going crazy. So they were having a limit at the trucks, but now it's unlimited so you can go buy yourself 4,000 bushels or whatever you want. <laughs> but um yeah, so they are going to we're going to uh, get some this week, and so if you go to tree-ripe.com, they have peaches, blueberries, and then they also have information where you don't have to buy half bushel. You can go to farmer's markets and get a smaller amount. So there you go. Get your and peaches. It's, uh, they, and and they it's have not just this week. It's, yeah. Well, yeah, and they have locations all over, including Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and Wisconsin, and it's not just this week. They have schedules, I think, until like the uh-huh. end of July. I'm not really uh-huh. sure. And then in the winter, they have really great citrus, so keep that in mind. Yes. So let's get into five July garden tips, and uh, these are things that maybe you don't uh, have not thought about, but we're going to go over these so we all can be better at gardening during the month of July. One is do so, not, don't leave space. Right. So, like, we're going to harvest garlic today. And what are we going to put in behind We're that? going to put fall peas in behind one bed of garlic. And once we get the other bed weeded, we have weeds. Yeah, we're not perfect. We will put uh, more uh, bush beans in behind the other uh, garlic because we uh, crop rotation. We want to put something in. We just don't want to lay it, lay it uh, empty. Now, we will talk with Pam around the mama about uh, cover crops and the importance of that and maybe why you want to practice that particular method but we're going to continue it's the summer we got space we got seed we're going to dump these seeds in the garden and get the the fall crops going right so that's something to keep in mind or maybe you think okay my carrots aren't doing too well you could plant some in a container see how that goes for you 
and you know any crop really if you if you're questioning it maybe try planting something else it's not too late i know people who planted their their tomatoes last weekend so. yeah, nothing wrong with that no. tomatoes uh, will go all the way up to frost so another thing stay ahead of the weeds and this is something that a lot of people don't uh, have time for we talked a little bit about in the last segment about leaving some weeds for those bad bugs to attach themselves to to attract them to those weeds and not your plants but at least if you do a little what, what's the saying uh do a little and do it often right and that's something that's very true you could come home from work you know maybe have some dinner and then go out and i know it doesn't sound exciting 15 minutes but 15 minutes 20 minutes before you sit down watch tv read whatever you do play with the kids get your kids to help you weed whatever you're doing you know take 15 20 minutes Go out and weed and then by you know, do that every day and you're gonna get fresh air. You've been in the office all day or something, you're gonna get that fresh air and you'll be glad because you'll have that weeding to a minimum. So yeah, uh weeding and you might find some surprises, some volunteer plants that have come up from last year. Like we have in the uh, front yard garden, we've got some tomatoes coming up. We've got radishes coming up that seeded. We've got dill from four years ago that's still growing. It continues to reseed itself that I'm trying to eliminate because it's invasive. Another thing, replace mulch as needed. Now, mulch can be a variety of organic or inorganic materials. We recommend organic because organic will break down. If you're going to use grass clippings, again, weed-free and chemical-free grass clippings, if you use grass clippings that has been sprayed with a treatment, a weed and feed or other chemicals, those are harboring inside of those grass clippings and will release into the soil around your plants in which you're mulching and it will kill the plants because it contains, most of these chemicals contain a 2,4-D um, residue which is used in agricultural use to kill weeds and that will kill your, veg- your, your, your garden. So keep that in mind. Also, what other kind of mulches do we have that we could use? Straw. All right, straw. Straws are very good mulch. As uh, well. Leaves obviously are not the pr- predominant uh, choice right Maybe now. Maybe you could go out there, shake a tree, with it, see what happens. Yeah, uh, probably get a squirrel would fall in yeah. your head. Uh, you want to uh, save those leaves or up, um, make a mound in the fall, like we do. We mound all the leaves in our right. garden. That's and, what. That's and we're still thing. using those leaves as that are mounded as mulch. Right, and that's something definitely, and we'll talk about that more again in the fall too. But think about what you can use in mulch for mulch. Yeah, mulch. What you can be very creative here. You can take an old sock, preferably one that doesn't have holes in it, fill it with sand until, and then wrap it around your container, and you actually create an insulation barrier between the soil and the air, and it won't dry out nearly as quick. If you just put sand on top of it, you're going to work that sand eventually into the soil. And you, you may not, you know, want that. But that's another idea, or you can make little sand socks or whatever. That We've done that a couple of years ago, and it did work. Right. That's definitely um, a, a good idea for sure. Otherwise, just make sure you're checking on your containers. That's And that's another thing is we, we talked about watering in the previous segment, but it's also something that you want to keep in mind. We've been really lucky with the rain, but that's not always the case. Right. It does, uh, no matter what, uh, 100, uh, 90, 90 degrees, and that's what it was a couple of days ago, containers dry out incredibly quick at 90 degrees, no matter how large they are and how much moisture, or how much, you know, moisture you can put in them the day before. And this is the time of year when we're always saying make sure you water in the morning or the evening, not during midday. This is the time we're talking about right now. Not because it's going to hurt the plants if you get water on them in the middle of the day. No, but it's it's because it's going to be the best absorption. We're having the, not that it's been that hot, but the the hottest times of the year. And so you want to keep that in mind. Preferably, if you have a choice, go in the morning because the plants are not stressed. They've been relaxed over the night, and they're able to absorb what moisture they need before the stress of the heat comes on. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about what you need to do to lessen the stress on your plants in your garden so they can produce throughout the summer months because August is usually, one late July, early August is usually the hottest portion of the year here in uh, Milwaukee, so we'll cover that in a couple of weeks. Keep up on the deadheading. Yeah, this is uh, what is first of all for people who are like, what is that? Uh, what is deadheading? So this is mostly for going to be for flower gardeners or people who grow a lot of flowers. And when when the flowers, the flower buds um, or the flowers themselves start to look sad, you want to just pinch the flowers off, and that will help produce more flowers essentially. Or cut them. Or cut them. You can do that too. Now the reason why you want to do this is. It, as a plant, or as we're talking about flowers here, as the flower dies, head dies back, seeds are being formed inside of that head, and once the plant realizes it, it has produced enough offspring or seeds to drop and 
potentially grow next year, it will stop growing, stop producing buds, stop flowering. So by removing the, the, the flower heads that have died back, you're actually encouraging the plant to flower more because it's going into essentially a stress situation where I don't have any seeds for next year, for the next generation of this strain of flower, this is what the plant's thinking. So I've got to cr- create more flowers to create more seeds because I've lost all of them that I currently had. Now, there are some that you don't have to deadhead. It's they've hibernized some of these. But overall, you want to deadhead those. Uh, remove those from the plant. Just, they just don't look ap- uh, uh, pleasing to the eye when you just see a bunch of dead flowers on the ground. But don't do this to your tomato plants. No, this is just strictly we're, for we're flowers. Refer- yeah, we're referring to plants. And some growing. roses. Right. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, when, when it comes to uh, deadheading. And another July gardening tip I would have to say would be to Think about your fall planting. And we're going to talk, yeah, we're, we won't get in too much right now. We'll be talking about that. Next week, next second, week, second. But it is something to think about if you, maybe you're, you'll be busy this weekend, next weekend, and you want to think about it this weekend. It's definitely something that is going to be coming up soon. One thing with the, the fall planting, you don't have to start your seeds indoors like you typically would have to in the, in the early, like February, January, February, March. You can direct sow them right in the ground and in my gardener still has a variety of seeds fall seeds that are available that you can get for 99 cents and get those shipped to your house for very low cost uh other thing joe lample talked about an organic practice of mowing your or lawn maintenance uh, a couple of weeks ago which was which you want to keep it to be about three to four inches and it's to protect it from the summer heat now here in Wisconsin, most people cut their grass shorter because if it's wet and rainy, it helps less mosquitoes. So I guess that's what the thought process is. I'm not sure if that's scientifically backed or not. Um, so I think it kind of depends on where you live and, and what you want to do. I know some people don't like the look of that either. And sometimes if you're mowing, it seems kind of fruitless if your grass is only being cut down half an inch or so every week. Right. I want to get back to the deadheading just for a minute so people understand the proper procedure in order to deadhead. Uh, You can remove just above the leaves and below the flower head without affecting the the plant. Uh, Just take a clean cut. Make sure your your you know your snips or your scissors or whatever. You don't want to pinch it off because that's going to uh, have a jagged edge and it could actually introduce uh, uh, problems to your plant so you want to and you don't have you can just do this as your flower heads die not all of them die at the same time you can just remove a couple as you see needed and uh, or bring them inside you know put them on the uh, water on the table and soon maybe sooner than later will be time to dig your garlic like us today your potatoes within the next couple of weeks, and even possibly your onions. Right, uh, to keep that in mind. But again, with the potatoes, you want to wait until the plants begin to die back. It's not, we, we wait until the plants die back. Some people wait after the flowers bloom, and that is an indication that the tubers are nearly at maximum uh, size. We wait until the plant dies back to make sure that all the energy that is possible can go into the development of the tubers, and not, uh, we're not in a rush. Because we know what's going to go in behind some. Uh, we've got three patches of potatoes. We know what's going to go in behind uh, one of them, which will be fall garlic in October. And I'm still debating on what to put in the others. So when uh, we have gardening, we have the right tools. When we have mowing, you can have the right tools, and Aaron's can help you with that. Do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step, step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. Same location for over 80 years. Same zip code for over 80 years. Good uh, American-made products. When we come back, blogger Pam from Brown Thumb Mama will be with us to help us live more healthier and help us with our gardens right after this. a gardening question email joey and holly at twvg radio at gmail.com oh yeah what you say 
You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body smile. If you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation, there is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more, visit Bobex.com. B O B B. Ex.com. Eating natural and organic is not as expensive as it used to be, especially when you shop at Whitman. They have aisles full of certified organic food, from fruits and vegetables to dairy products and even meat, all at great prices. They even have a huge selection of wheat-free and gluten-free items. I can come to Woodman's and get everything I need all under one roof. My name is Alicia, and I shop at Woodman. Pot Shen Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed and more. Even kosher and gluten free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HotShenMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5 right here live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So happy you have joined us today. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening. Twitter, Facebook. Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more. Well, Blue Mel's, the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, they have changed their hours to their summer hours. So I want you to be aware of this so you don't go and try to go there and they're closed. Uh, they have now changed to uh, 7 a.m., uh, Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Sundays they are now closed. But that doesn't mean they don't have the quality and the products that they had before they switched their hours. Right, so Blue Mills have um, they have a wide variety of plants and garden supplies. A very knowledgeable staff that can answer all of the gardening your gardening questions. Many are master gardeners. Many are master gardeners. So it's not you know like we've always mentioned. It's not like you go to the big box store and, and Ray and Paint might it's have always an answer. Ray with you. <laughs> he might have an answer for you, but he might not. He might just be telling you something so you shut up and leave him alone. So he can go or he may he doesn't have the knowledge, so he's thinking he might know the answer, so he's going to tell you. But Blue Mills, they have landscape material. They have consultations on uh, your property if you need something done. They have wood chips, sand, mulch. Uh, they have compost, uh, native plants. They still they have all kinds of decorative items for your property, as well as the clo- enclosed playground for your children, as well as a coffee shop. If you just need somewhere to go for a little bit to get away from somebody you truly love, you can go there as well. Uh, where can they find all of this at? You can go to Blue Mills at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. That's just south of Layton. Or you can call 414-282-4220 or bluemills.com. Well, let's go to the IVOrganics.com hotline and bring our next guest in from Sacramento, California, Holly. Pam from BrownThumbMama.com is a blogger, author, busy mom, and advocate for healthy, natural living. On her blog she started in 2009, there are great recipes, gardening tips, money-saving ideas, and more. Welcome to the program, Pam. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, thank you for getting up early over on the Pacific Coast to be with us and our listeners. (laughs) Thanks. Well, we want to start out with, we had a question call in last week on the IVOrganics.com hotline about how to keep cats out of the garden. Now, I gave my answer, and I want to ask you, you've got a great article on your blog about keeping cats out of your garden, whether they're yours or not yours. What are some of your techniques into keeping these cats from using your garden as a litter box? Good question. So we don't have any cats ourselves, but our neighbors do. They have free-ranging kitties, and... 
there are lots of different things that you can try, and we've tried them all because there's nothing worse in your vegetable garden than a present from the neighbor cat. So um, there are ultrasonic uh, gizmos that shoot water. There's um, You can put orange peels. I guess the kitties don't like the smell of citrus. Um, there you can use rosemary essential oil or rosemary branches from your plants. Um, the thing that I've found to be the most effective, quite frankly, in our raised bed gardens is to just lay some pig fencing over the top so or some sort of mesh or a physical barrier so that they can't, if they can't get into the raised bed, they can't leave you any presents and it keeps the squirrels out too. Oh, there you go. Now, so you mentioned um, on your blog some natural cleaning tips like killing germs without bleach. What are some great natural uh, germ killing tips and cleaning tips, uh, especially without bleach these days? I was very surprised to find that there were ways that you could kill germs without bleach. Um, And this is the craziest thing because I'll bet you anything, you already have this in your cupboard. The the way to kill germs without using bleach is a two-step process. You're going to use vinegar and hydrogen peroxide of all the crazy things. So first you'll spray it just plain white vinegar. Doesn't even have to be um, doesn't even have to be the, the fancy good stuff. Spray the white vinegar like on your kitchen counter. Let it dry or let it sit there for at least a few minutes, and then you're going to spray the hydrogen peroxide over the top. And those two chemicals combine on contact to make a, a germ killing. Um, chemicals, the same stuff that they use at restaurants, but they use it at a much stronger concentration. The crazy thing is you can't combine them in a bottle because then they become inert. It has to happen. Um, you have to layer them. Stored. Yeah. It can't be stored. It has yeah. to be layered um, out there on your counter. So, yeah, we use that um, in the bathtub. If one of the kids has a, uh, an incident <laughs> um, in the kitchen, that kind of thing, so we definitely gets in use a lot. We just keep a spray bottle, we keep a spare bottle of vinegar and a spare bottle of uh, hydrogen peroxide under the kitchen sink with a spray lid already attached. Okay, so with that being said, many people might want to know, why, why not use bleach? Why are we avoiding using the bleach? Well, we have two little kids, so I am not a fan of bleach because, well, because of laundry mishaps because that you can get chemical burns from it. Um, we don't have any clothes that can be, um, we don't have anything that has that need to be super duper white. I mean, if I had, if I had clothes that needed to be a bright white, I would line dry them because that helps um, brighten them up and then they smell fantastic. So, for us, it's definitely a safety concern. Um, I don't want bleach residue on things, and I can do all of the cleaning and disinfecting that I need to do with natural stuff. And with the hydrogen peroxide, uh, lastly, with, when you attach the spray bottle, you can just use it from the store-bought bottle. You don't want to pour that into another bottle, or do you, or how does that work? I leave it in the store-bought bottle because it's it's darker, and you don't you don't want hydrogen peroxide in a clear bottle, or it will degrade. So I just um, we have a, a Costco by us, and that everything comes in a two pack or a nine hundred pack. So <laughs> we have an extra bottle, and I just have an extra spray lid that I recycled from something else, and zoop, there you go. Absolutely. Well, let's head to the garden here. We've never practiced this particular method, but you've got an article in the blog about cover cropping. Now, one, what is cover cropping? And two, what are the benefits of cover cropping versus just getting another bag of organic fertilizer and putting it in the garden bed? Sure. Okay. So I primarily have raised beds, especially um, I have some garden in my front yard, but most of my backyard is raised beds. And I have one of them has been planted in for several years and for what I thought at the time it was a strange reason all of a sudden that bed was not producing well and I couldn't figure out for the life of me what I hadn't done anything differently and then I realized I had been planting in that bed for several years and the soil was exhausted 
it was the plants need minerals and different nutrients from the soil, and I had not been replenishing it. You know, I'd maybe throw in some compost from my compost bin, um, but I hadn't been replenishing the soil effectively. So when I started doing some reading and talking to our master gardeners, I decided it was time to try a cover crop. And what that means is you plant a beneficial but expendable crop in the garden. And there are certain, you wouldn't plant, um, you, you want to plant something that has good nutrients. So you're not going to, you know, let the thistles grow or something weird like that. Um, I chose to plant red clover. Um, it helps. So you you plant it, you let it grow, but you don't let it go to seed if you can help it. You cut it down while it's still green and you till it into the soil. And what this does is it, of course, as the plants decompose, it gives extra nutrients to the soil. They can, the roots will go into the soil and loosen it. There will be um, insects. It helps grow the soil food web, have... um, It prevents erosion and a raised bed. That's not always a big concern, but it provides so much more. It is it is the way that nature has always worked, and it's more in harmony with nature than throwing in some chemicals or even grabbing another bag of um, of fertilizer at the garden center. Okay, makes sense. Right, definitely. So. What are some natural ways to get rid of bad bugs in your garden? Oh, so many bugs. Uh, so bugs are the worst. I've been doing war uh, war against aphids since, I think, since I planted my first watermelon plant when we moved in. Um, so for us, so aphids are a killer for us. Um, and, of course, you spray them off with water. Um, we can buy ladybugs. At the garden center, that's super fun with kids. Um, Buy a bag of ladybugs, let them go at dusk, and um, our aphid infestation one year was so bad, but the ladybugs were just as happy as all get out because they thought they had landed at the world's best buffet. Um, So the kids got a really big kick out of that. Um, Tomato worms are absolutely awful and if you can find them on your tomato plants you kind of have to sit there and study every branch for a while uh, you pick them suckers off and feed them to the chickens so that would be or or squish them the kids like to squish them um, for we have a big strawberry patch and so we have snails and slugs um, with the kids around I don't want to put snail bait out or um, or even with the neighbor's kitty I don't want to put snail bait out so there's a, a few things that we've done. Um, the secret weapon for snails and slugs is, is to get the kids out there in, after dark because it's probably past their bedtime and they're tickled to death to be up and doing stuff. So they can be your snail hunters and, um, and pick, them, you know, pick them up and squish them. Um, I have also seen some folks have had good luck with uh, sinking a like an empty tuna fish can, uh, sink it into the ground a little bit and put a tiny bit of beer in the bottom. For whatever reason, the snails and slugs are attracted to that, and then they fall in to get a drink and they can't get out. So snails, they go in, they go in, they get schnuckered, and then they're stuck in the in the tuna can, and you can dispose of them the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, natural weed killers. You, we can use this glyphosine stuff. You get the store, and, and you, you know it's not re- good for you because it burns your lungs, or you just don't. You know, what, what are what are some ways you found that work that can eliminate weeds, whether in your garden or in your flower patch or just places in your gar- in your yard? You just don't want specific types of weeds. It's, so that one weed killer weed killing can be tricky because. Whether it's chemical or it's natural, you um, the 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 stuff you're spraying doesn't know which ones are your strawberries and which ones are the weeds. So obviously, the the best way is to going to be to go through and pull them out by hand. But when you have uh, a, like a maybe a big area, or if it's in between your raised beds and you just can't even imagine pulling out another 
piece of nut grass. Um, the the best thing that I found is a um, a mixture home homegrown mixture, um, two cups of white vinegar, a tablespoon of salt, and a teaspoon or so of dish soap, and you mix those up together, and um, spray it on whatever weed you have. Now remember, it's gonna it's gonna kill whatever it touches. Whatever it touches. So don't don't spray. You know, grandma's gladiola or something something important because the the spray doesn't know the difference. But but spray the goodness out of whatever weeds you have, and um, they will. It takes a little bit of time, but they will dry up, and, and then you can. Um, It'll, they'll dry up and you can pull them out or just till them under and they'll be all right. There you go. So with what, before we let you go, we want to ask you about... Where can people find you and all your great information and find your book? Absolutely. So I am on the web at brownthumbmama.com, B-R-O-W-N-T-H-U-M-B-M-A-M-A. Um, uh, all the usual suspects, Facebook, Pinterest, etc. And so you can find my um, my book on my website, on Amazon as well, all kinds of, all, all over the place. Well, Pam, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day there in Sacramento to join Holly, myself, and our listeners in sharing some of your garden and home uh, remedy knowledge with all of us. Thanks. I'm tickled to be here. Thank you, Pam. And we will be right back after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. Have a gardening question? You can call into the iorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at GreenstockGarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. GreenstockGarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenstockGarden.com. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh loose carrot juice. A health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414-278-7878, and online at beansandbarley.com. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pot or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mills is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to two environmentally conscious organic gardeners. If you spray chemicals on your garden to get rid of those bad bugs, those chemicals are not, uh, they don't just kill the bad bugs. They kill all the bugs in your garden. And without having a balanced ecosystem, your plants and your particular growing zone can suffer. Joey and Holly Baird. 
It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener on 860 AM WNOV and W293 CX 106.5. The Gardener.com is your location for everything you need to know about gardening. 925 plus videos, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and a whole lot more. Ivy Organic uh, Hotline at 414-444-5250 uh, for your gardening questions and our answers. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. It's non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, you can go to ivyorganics.com. And the number is 444-5250. We got a couple of questions that came in this week on social media: Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, email TWVG Radio, and uh, we're going to go over those to help you in your garden and uh, for this one, your kitchen. Uh, this was a reference to the segment we did several weeks ago about the uh, alternatives to all-purpose flour, which can be found on the website under the highlight tab and the radio tab. What is the difference between bread flour and all-purpose flour? So bread flour is a specialized for for using in yeasted breads. It has a protein content, a higher protein content than all purpose flour, um, and that protein helps develop more gluten in the bread to create a higher rise. And I wanted to mention also when I don't know where somebody had made that comment. When we talk about all bleached all purpose flour, we realize that there's unbleached all purpose flour. But most commonly, when people are buying all purpose flour, it's going to be the bleach variety. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Does uh, do you have to have heirloom plants in order to save seeds uh, in your garden, or or is there a problem if you don't? Well, yes and no. Um, hybrid seeds, when you save those, they are not going to be the same as what whatever you planted. That seed might. There's, there's, there's still going to be a tomato if you save a tomato right. a hybrid seed. <laughs> it's they, not going to grow a cucumber, right? But, but it, it's not going to be that exact variety. And the reason for that being because when these hybrids are created, once you save that seed, it might turn into. Uh, it, it's based. The, those hybrid seeds have been hybridized, hybridized be, to favor two different two two different things. It's possibly. not a DNA GMO alternation. No, it's, it's, it's not a natural like that. thing. It's like a natural thing. So say you you got a hybrid tomato like an early girl that's going to, you know, produce early, but also with that it's a heavy producer. So you might come up with a tomato that is a heavy producer, but it not, might not produce early like an early girl if you save that seed. Yeah. And so be what you now you can save organic seeds if you if you're not uh, if they're not heirloom, but it's best if we save the heirloom seeds to uh, carry on the specific traits of those plants in which we want to uh, grow next year or in the fall. And if somebody gives you some seeds to grow that are heirloom variety, you you want to save those seeds. It's definitely not like, hey, just grow these seeds because I told you so. Like, It's definitely, uh, I think, a respect thing as well. Well, what if you don't know if they're hybrid seeds or not? I mean, what if you planted something you don't know you threw the package away like many of us do, and you don't know if that particular is hybrid or not. You talked about that. You're going to get that variety in which you planted. It just may not have the right. same characteristics in it's which... Not, it's, not like, it's not like you're not going to get a plant or it's going to be some something crazy. It may not taste as good, though. It may not taste as good, but it's definitely something that is it... Like, should you not do it? If you, if you consciously do it, just realize that it's not going to be exactly the same. How do you get rid of uh, squash bugs organically? There's a lot of chemical applications in which you can spray on the on the squash plant under the leaves, is typically where these squash bug eggs lay, are, are laid, and that's the part of the hide, hide, you know, keep them cool and and get them to grow correctly by the bad insects. One is you want to visually look, as we talked about in the first segment, want to be aware of what's going on in your garden. Look under those squash plant leaves and if you see a cluster of dots those are the squash eggs and you want to squish them with your hand uh, is the best means of extraction but uh, you can also encourage ladybugs to come in your garden you can also spray them with a water to knock them loose Um, those are the two um, main uh, ways to remove them but uh, be vigilant and pay attention Uh, if you haven't planted your squash yet we've already got squash summer summer squash that is producing because we grew them uh started them under translucent lid coffee cans that we set in the ground back in early april and we've already got stuff producing but if you haven't already and there's nothing wrong you can still plant and they only take about 70 days to reach maturity you can cover them with a finely woven 
uh, net to prevent a lot of these insects from getting in them and on them until they begin to flower, then you want to remove that netting. So here's a question about tomato tomato leaf curl essentially is is what it is. Um, There's a lot of diseases in which your tomato yeah. plant can get. Uh, tomato leaf curl is one of them, and there's some possible uh, reasons why and uh, potential cures for the leaf curl. So one thing is that if the tomato feels it's it's having it's going to have problems, it's just a defense mechanism. The leaves are going to curl. There's also a virus that causes this that could be in your soil. So. That's why it's important to know where you're getting your soil from. Because whoever I asked this was having this problem in their containers. So if they had purchased questionable, whatever they purchased to put in their containers, it could it could have that that situation going on. Um, and then if there's if it's too cool and too moist, that could cause problems. Tomatoes are sensitive, and the thing is is that tomatoes are technically a tropical plant, and we're trying to essentially grow them all over the world, and so sometimes that could be problematic. So this person didn't quite indicate where they were or but it's, if it's a problem that's right. persistent no matter where you're at well in the right country. that's the thing but um you have to keep in mind that if you sometimes if you ask us a question we have to have a picture which they did it, send but sometimes more information is helpful too uh it doesn't affect uh although the, the physiological effects of the tomato leaf curl doesn't affect the overall growth of the crop yield of the plant uh the tomato leaf curl it is a viral infection and, and it can uh, hurt some of the production of the plant. So uh, if you have those, you know, floating row cover is a thing that you can put over top of them or in the early stages to help Another that. Another problem is yeah. that um, if it's just one plant, you can just you can just rip that plant out sometimes. And that's like, usually the better scenario instead of going and doing and purchasing and trying to figure out what's wrong with that specific specific type of tomato. And also, when you do have that, remember or do your best to remember what variety it was because it may be that specific type of variety not reacting well to your garden, your soil. If everything else is fine, we grow, I think it's 39 varieties of tomatoes. So we kind of... Uh, have an idea of what works very well in our garden and what doesn't work well in our garden. And the ones that don't work well in our garden, we don't grow. Uh, we eliminate those from our selection in early spring when we start them. So is it safe to use water condensation from our HVAC unit in the garden? Yes. Uh, there's, I wouldn't recommend drinking it because of the, the way it's put together. But uh, there's nothing uh, on, a, on a hot day like a couple of days ago, we were at 90 degrees. Your air condition unit of any uh, that that hangs out your window air, con- can pr- air window air conditioner unit can produce five gallons of water. And what do you see underneath that air conditioned unit in your yard by your house where that water has been dripping? Enormous plants, <laughs> uh, enormous weeds and grass. Right. So what you can do is uh, one, you could either figure some way of piping that from that unit into your raised beds. Or you can also just put a bucket underneath it, and you've got free water. Now, there are different ways in whether, if you're going to drink it, I would have some means of filtering it. But uh, it's just like coming out of a dehumidifier. It's the same procedure. It's removing that moisture from the air to make the inside of your home cool. So there's nothing wrong with using it. Uh, we've done it. We use water from the HVAC unit uh, very, very commonly because it's free water, and you don't have to pay the city for it. And it's clean. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. But uh, I wouldn't drink it. Uh, no, but it's fine for your plants. Absolutely. Just, just don't drink it. Well, this program is brought to you each week by the, the wonderful companies that uh, you hear throughout the program. And... Nacelle Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nacelle is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. If look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nacelle Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at nacelle.com. Programming note next week. Join us. We're going to go over what is great in our garden and what is not doing so good. And we want to hear what's going on in your garden, whether it's good or bad. You don't have to have a question. You can just dial in and say, hey, tomatoes look great. Peppers look sad. And that's uh, our tomatoes are looking great and our peppers are hit and miss. So we look forward to hearing what your, how good and or how bad some of the problems are in your garden or your crops. As well as we're going to talk all about what you can start right now in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, so we can get a harvest fall planting. We're going to talk about that as well as Amanda from Freedom Acres. She's a single mom 
uh, frugal living, building a homestead. We're going to talk about uh, how, and and she's all about essential oils, using natural means of healing instead of pharmaceutical means of healing. And she will be with us, and she likes helping people along the way, so she'll be with us. So if you miss any portion of this program or want to revisit the program in its entirety, you can find that underneath the radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website. Uh, for full-length podcasts and in-studio videos. If you want to revisit specific topics or certain uh, specific interviews, you can find that underneath the Highlight tab on the main page of the website. Well, until next week, for Holly Beard, I'm Joy Beard, and we will see you in the garden.